Well, good morning. morning. It's fantastic to welcome you here this morning. I'm Derek Hughes. I'm the minister of the church here at Dale St. Andrews. And we especially welcome you if you're visiting us. You'll see in the center section where the kids of our Sunday school normally uh, sit. We've got loads of visitors this morning and over in this section too and probably in other parts of the sanctuary. So we welcome the family and friends of Alan and Amanda Bryce, who are here for the baptisms of Brodie and Leila and Blair. That happens towards the latter part of our service this morning. If there are wee ones under the age of three years, then there is a creche, which is through this door, and second, I have to think about that, there's second on the right Um, So if you feel that the kids are getting a wee bit fed up in my sermon, then you can take them through there. That was the kids I said, (laughs) no the adults, just so that you know. There is tea and coffee after the service this morning. And again, if you follow this uh, door and corridor through to its end, you'll find a large hall there. Just follow your noses for the smell of the coffee. Do join us for further fellowship in the hall at the end of the service this morning. Our assistant minister, Stuart Love, is on holiday this week. This is the last day of his holiday, Um, although I dare say maybe have a wee bit of time off tomorrow with it being a bank holiday. Um, So we hope that Stuart's had a good week off. This morning we launch a very particular new pilot project. Uh, Those of you who are regularly with us will know that for a wee while we have had a lady in our congregation, Ray Blagg, who has used British Sign Language to interpret the prayers in our service. But from today onwards, we're going to have someone who will use BSL to interpret everything that happens in the service. And so, Helen, down to my left, I hope you're introducing yourself, Helen. (laughs) with a smile on her face and her hands going 20 to the dozen trying to interpret my colloquialisms, is going to sign for those who watch our live stream. Now, we've actually got two live streams this morning. For the last three years, we've had one live stream. Now, we've got a second live stream. And on that, as well as having Helen down in a wee box, they'd love to put me in a box, Helen. (laughs) But maybe I shouldn't go there. As well as having Helen in a wee box on the screen, there will be subtitles which appear for those who are deaf or hearing impaired. And Brenda, over in the corner, typing away in her laptop, is doing that. Now, we hope to do this for the next year because we know that there's a huge number of people out there who would love to join us in worship but who are deaf or hearing impaired. If there is anyone in the congregation here this morning who has difficulty hearing and understands British Sign Language, and if you can't quite see Helen from where you're sitting, then you're welcome during the opening hymn to come down and sit in these seats over to the left, um, if you wish. And then just one further thing this morning. Next week, we're looking forward to admitting new elders to our leadership team, and so I've got an edict to read, so bear with me, will you? Leslie Angus, Elaine Geddes, Ian Jackson, Alicia Manson, Derek Milton, Ian Morrison, Andrew Nielsen, Andrew Stephen, Daniel Tudor, Stuart Watson, Leanne Weir, members of this congregation, have been elected to be ruling elders. And the Kirk Session has judged them to be qualified for that office and has sustained their election. Leslie Angus, Elaine Geddes, Ian Jackson, Alicia Manson, Derek Milton, Ian Morrison, Andrew Nielsen, Andrew Stephen, Daniel Tudor, Stuart Watson, Leanne Weir, have accepted office as elders. If anyone has any objections why any of these members should not be ordained or admitted to office, they state their objection at the meeting of the Kirk Session in the Lower Hall on Sunday the 8th of May 2016 at 10.45 a.m. If no relevant objection regarding life or doctrine is made and substantiated, the Kirk Session will proceed to the ordination and admission. Signed by our session clerk, Crawford Moffat. So, come back again next Sunday. It will be a superb time for us again. We're going to join our voices together in worshipping the Lord, because that's why we're here. 
So maybe put all the news items on screens and what I've just announced kind of in the back burner just now, and let's just join our voices and our hearts together and bring our praise to the Lord. Our opening hymn is 184, if you're following in a hymn book, but it will also appear on the screens. Sing to the Lord a joyful song. Lift up your hearts, your voices raise. And now we're going to draw close to the one of whom and to whom we've been singing, the Lord God Almighty, the one who draws us closer to Him and to His heart by His love shown to us in Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? Let us pray. Almighty God, Your wonders surround us, and Your glorious works inspire our souls. We gather before You to praise and honor Your majestic and most holy name. Your peace calms our restless spirits, and Your love strengthens our faithful hearts. And so we cheerfully worship and gladly adore Your majestic and most holy name. Gracious Father, we regret our past mistakes. We lament the sinful ways in which we have lived. We seek Your pardon for all our faults and Your mercy for all our misdeeds. Help us, Lord, to heal the wounds we have caused and enable us to forgive the injuries we have experienced. Pardon our foolish prejudices and our stubborn pride. Absolve us of our ungrateful and unloving ways. And hear us now as silently from our hearts we pray before you, seeking forgiveness and reconciliation.
loving Lord, accept our admission of failure and receive our repentant prayers. Wash our souls in Christ's blood and cleanse our spirits from all our sin, for He alone can save and restore us. Today we receive Christ's blessings of mercy and of grace, as well as His pardon and His forgiveness. We rejoice in the goodness of God to us, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our risen Lord, now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to turn to our Bible reading for this morning. If you have your own Bible, then you can follow there. If not, then the words will appear on the screens in front of you. We've been thinking over the last few weeks about the importance of the resurrection of Jesus following on from Easter. And we've worked our way through the story about Jesus rising from the dead in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But just to show you that the resurrection is mentioned and is important elsewhere in Scripture, this morning we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. Now, you would do well to read the whole of this chapter because it's a great exposition about the importance of what we believe, that death is not the end, but that in Christ an eternity of life with God awaits those who believe. But we're only going to read verses 1 to 22 this morning. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through to 22. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, He appeared to me also as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses, liars about God, for we have testified about God that he, raised in, that he raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. 
as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. It's at this point when you read something like that that you expect everybody to shout, Amen, or Hallelujah, because this is such a central and important passage that feeds hope into our hearts. We'll come back to look at that in just a moment. But before that, let's sing a song which reflects on the reality of the fact that death is defeated because Christ is risen and the tomb is empty. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. If you're following in a hymn book, it's number 443. the importance of the resurrection over the past few weeks, and we've worked our way through all four Gospels, and we've seen the different information that these Gospel writers has, have given us. And now we turn to First Corinthians, to Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. And this chapter, chapter 15, is extremely important because the arguments that are put forward by the Apostle Paul are absolutely fundamental to our faith. He says it, and it's certainly true. If I didn't have an approved passport, then I wouldn't be legally allowed to travel to other countries. And in a similar way, if we don't understand and apply in our own lives what's written here in this chapter, then our future de destination is uncertain. But I would go as far as to say more than that. It's not just that heaven or the hope of heaven is not assured, but also our present reality, the way that we live on a day-to-day -day basis is negatively impacted if we don't understand, don't believe, and don't practice the reality of the resurrection. So, from a future dimension, but also from a present tense, these words that Paul offers us today are absolutely crucial. Evidence about the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb of Christ, gives a basis for hope. And it's not a vain hope. It's not the kind of hope that says, oh, well, I hope I win the lottery this week. Although that's not a hope that relates to me because I'm too tight even to pay a quid for a ticket. It's a sure and a steadfast hope. It's a hope that's based on evidence. And that's what Paul offers us this morning. So I want to spend some time with you this morning explaining why 
what Paul is bringing to us in 1 Corinthians 15 was significant in the first century to those who first read and heard this letter. And then I want to expand upon it by saying why it's fundamental for you and me and for people of faith in every generation. But first of all, I suppose a wee bit of history lesson, if you like. The early church was a mixture of Jew and Gentile believers. As you may know, there were two dominant groups, even within Judaism. The Jews were split into Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees were a group to which Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, the writer of this letter, belonged. And the Sadducees were a separate group entirely. The Pharisees believed in life beyond death, but the Sadducees didn't. That's why they were sad, you see. I'm just waiting and listening for the penny to drop. (laughs) All right. Anyway, joking apart, even some Jews in the church, people who'd become believers in Jesus as the Christ, had to be convinced of the truth, particularly of the nature of the resurrection. And so Paul, because he was now Paul, because he had changed his name to reflect the change in his nature that had taken place when he had met the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, Paul sets about bringing to them the basic truth of the gospel. Now, the word gospel just means good news. And the good news about Jesus Christ, Paul is saying, is that He died for our sin, according to the Scriptures, and that He rose again from the dead, according to the Scriptures. That's what it says in verses 3 and 4 of the passage that we read. Now, that's a backwards nod, if you like, towards the prophecies in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament where Isaiah spoke about a suffering servant. He would be the Messiah. He would be the Christ. He'd be the one who would come to give His life as the anointed Son of God so that those who put their trust in Him would also live. It's not surprising that Isaiah has been called the fifth gospel because it's got so much about the life, the the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even although it never mentions His name. The Jews who had come to faith in Jesus needed some help to understand about the resurrection. The Gentiles were in even greater need of instruction because they largely subscribed to the philosophy of a Greek mindset. Now, Corinth, the letter to whom the city to whom this letter was written, was a Greek city. And it was heavily influenced by a belief that all things physical were somehow bad. One of the things we were taught at college when I was training for ministry was that there was a common um, phrase that they used, which was called soma sima, which meant that the body was the tomb of the soul. So, all things physical, what you can touch, was regarded by the Greeks as being bad but that which was good was the spiritual, the soul. And so, when preaching at Athens about Christ's resurrection, this same Paul who's writing this letter encountered some opposition. It tells us in Acts chapter 17 and verse 32 that those who listened to what Paul was saying about Jesus having died and been brought back to life 
they sneered at him. Because he spoke about a bodily resurrection, the Greeks sneered at him. Because all things physical, the body, was to be considered bad. So, if they saw any future beyond death, it was not for the body. It was for a more spiritual part, a soul perhaps. Now, let me say to you that the church in the first century and also today has become infected with that belief. We talk about our souls going on. What happens to this? Well, you might say it's either buried or it's burnt. It's either in the cemetery or at the crematorium. But the Bible teaches that there will come a time when the physical and the spiritual will be brought back together again in the resurrection. Because Paul contends quite rightly, and in opposition to Greek philosophy and thought, that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, but that His body was raised from the tomb. Now, we've been looking at these Gospels over the last few weeks, and it's pretty plain to see, isn't it, when you study these stories, that although when Jesus rose from the dead, He was somehow different, because they didn't always necessarily immediately recognize Him, there was also continuity with what had gone before. So, it was changed body, but it was still a body. It was a body, we know, because at the lakeside, He ate some fish with the disciples. He invited Thomas, you remember, to come and touch the nail prints in his hands and the mark in his side. So, it was a physical body. And that's why in all of the great creeds of the church down through the centuries, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, we talk about the resurrection of the body. This was foreign to those of a Greek philosophy and mindset. But Paul says here in verse 3 that it is of first importance. It's a top priority. The resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the tomb is pivotal to the Christian faith. Dispense with it, and there's a whole lot of implications come from that. So, moving on, having stressed the excellence of this doctrine which Paul is expounding, what's the supporting evidence? Well, the evidence comes largely in the form of eyewitness accounts. If he were in a court of law, he calls to the stand Cephas. Now, Cephas is just another name for Simon Peter. He calls to the stand James, who was the half-brother of Jesus. He calls to the stand a crowd of more than 500 people, it tells us as this text goes on, to whom Jesus appeared after His resurrection. And last of all, He calls to the stand Himself, Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and yet someone who had come to understand that the law alone was not enough, but that a personal encounter with the risen Jesus Christ was what was required. Those of a skeptical disposition might say that each of these folk, Cephas, Simon Peter, James, the half-brother of Jesus, a crowd of 500 or more disciples, all had a vested interest in believing that Jesus had risen from the tomb. But that's certainly not true of Saul of Tarsus. He opposed the church. He persecuted the church. He stood and watched as people were killed just simply because they were followers of Jesus. But even if you think about those who were followers of Jesus, 
being the ones who told others about His resurrection. And you say, ah, well, you know, it was in their interest to say that because they believed. Then would these women and men have gone to their death for a lie? Would they have endured persecution, being ostracized, being isolated in the community? Would they have fought against wild animals in the arena to perpetuate a myth? These people were utterly committed to the truth that Jesus Christ had conquered death. Many of them had met Him personally, but they went on to tell others about how He had impacted their life. Paul even describes himself as, in verses 9 to 10, the least of the apostles. I persecuted the church of God. And then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace to me was not without effect. As well as the eyewitness accounts that we have of Jesus' resurrection from the tomb, we have the evidence of changed lives. Saul not only changed his name to Paul, he was a completely changed person. So, when people oppose you for saying that you're a follower of Jesus, they might protest that they don't like what you're saying, but they shouldn't be able to deny the evidence that they see in a changed life. Because if you are not the better for having met the risen Lord Jesus Christ, then may I venture to suggest to you boldly, you have, met, you have not met the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you meet Christ, He changes you. And I could give you a whole host of examples of lives that have been changed down through the centuries. Jesus changes people. In the verses that are left in the rest of the chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, which we didn't read, Paul presses home the point about the resurrection of Jesus and those who trust Him. He says, if it is preached, in verse 12, that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. In other words, I'm out of job. But so is your faith, useless, if Christ has not been raised from the dead. And then verse 15 says this, very strongly. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. The New International Version is quite polite there. It means that we're liars. We're deluded. We're dead. And we're leading other folk up the garden path. We're without God. We're without hope. So, what Paul is saying here in these amazing and important verses of 1 Corinthians 15 is, it's either a lie or it's life. The late Alan Redpath, a great preacher of a past time, said this, when it comes to faith in the resurrection of Jesus, the early church would not have lasted one week without it. He's right, of course. The message would never have survived a generation, far less come all the way down through two millennia to you and to me if it had been found to be false. But it is not false. It is true. And one of the most telling verses in this passage, amongst a host of telling verses, is verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, 
we have are, are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, if we have backed the wrong horse in believing that Jesus rose from the dead, then we don't merely lose our stake, we lose everything. Everything. But, but, one American preacher once said in the heat of his sermon, we all have a but. Well, we do. And you're all sitting on it presently. But it's not that kind of but that Paul is referring to here. In verse 20, he says, but... And then listen to these glorious verses. Listen to this. And don't just listen to it. Believe it. Soak it in. Let it find a resting place in your heart today. Whether you believed it for a long time, whether you've come to the faith in it recently, or whether maybe for the first time today you're hearing it. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Wow! Adam was the man who was made from the dust of the earth, Christ came down from heaven. Adam was selfish and disobedient. Christ did his Father's will completely and always. Adam was rejected and died in dishonor. Christ was exalted by God. Adam has got the stench of death about him. Christ brings the aroma of life, eternal life. As Paul goes on to explain, to die believing in Christ is to be like a seed or a spring bulb which is planted in the soil. You look at that seed, it doesn't appear to be very much. You look at that dry, dusty bulb, you put it in the ground, a few months later, what happens? You've got a beautiful bloom, a flower, something that's come from what has been planted is not quite the same. And gives hope, doesn't it? Look around you at this time and see the spring flowers. Doesn't it give you hope that summer is on its way? <laughs> well, we hope it is. And finally, let me offer you this story. Because I think it sums up really well what Paul is trying to say in 1 Corinthians 15 and what I perhaps inadequately tried to express today. The story is about a church building in the city of London during World War II. The sanctuary of the church was prepared for harvest thanksgiving when all of a sudden it was laid to waste by a bomb through a savage air raid. Months passed. The spring arrived. And on the site where the church had previously stood rather proudly, green shoots began to emerge, to poke through the rubble. And in the autumn, there was a big patch of corn, because the sheaf of corn that had been at the communion table prior to that bombing had once more come to life. Thank God for the reality of the resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. It's a message of life, of health, of peace. Not only for just now, to inspire us to go on when times are tough, but for all eternity. And to know that we will be with Him one day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, many doubt you, relying on their own wisdom and strength, 
They last only for a time and then pass away. But we come today to affirm once more that we believe. We believe in the resurrection of the body and in the life everlasting. And so, placing fresh faith in Jesus, your crucified and risen Son, we have the assurance of your love. That love can never be defeated nor die. Thank you, Lord, for that love which will never let us go. Amen. And now, responding to God's Word to our hearts, let's sing one of the more modern songs that we sing here in our church. All my days I will sing this song of gladness, beautiful Savior, wonderful Counselor, clothed in majesty, Lord of history, you're the way, the truth, and the life. As we've given our praises to God, let's now bring to Him our offering. The offering will now be uplifted.
Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, You have risen from the dead to show us the way to eternal life. You have given us absolutely everything. We know that we can never repay our debt to You. But with grateful spirits and cheerful hearts, we bring to You now our treasures, our talents, our time. Take these gifts, we pray, for the work of Your ministry, for the spreading of the gospel, and to the glory of Your name, both here in this community and across the world. Lord, with faces touched by the light of a new day and hearts warmed by our worship and the message of new life, we come before You to pray for the needs of our world. Into the presence of the risen Christ, we bring those who are struggling with illness, with despair, or in the breakdown of a relationship. May the light of Christ shine upon them. Into the presence of the risen Christ, we bring those places in our world where war and violence and poverty and need our everyday experiences for women and men and young people. May the light of Christ shine upon them. Into the presence of the risen Christ, we bring all those who suffer from the effects of violence, bereavement, or conflict. May the light of Christ shine upon them. And into the presence of the risen Christ, we bring ourselves, the private struggles, the heart's yearnings, the hidden dreams, and the unfulfilled potential. May the light of Christ shine upon us, now and always, we pray. Amen. And now as we prepare for the baptisms of Brody and Leila and Blair, we're going to sing a song. Our children, Lord, in faith and prayer, we now devote to you. In a sense, this is a prayer not just for the three youngsters who are being brought to the font for their baptism today, but for all the youngsters in our church family. Some of them are here with us this morning, despite there being no Sunday school and some of them elsewhere, perhaps on holiday. So let's sing this, this hymn. It's number 62 in the hymn books if you're following there.
Please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. At this local church, we are very blessed to have a huge number of children and young people. We never take that for granted. And very often we do have baptisms as we recognize uh, in a kind of public way the bringing of these little ones into our extended church family. More often than not, it's one baby or child. Sometimes it's an adult because in the Church of Scotland we baptize adults through their own belief, their own faith, their own confession of faith. But sometimes it's a couple, like last week we had a couple of wee boys who were baptized. But today it's a real pleasure to have three children in the one family to be baptized. Brody, Alan, Bryce. Oh, I got his attention when I said that. <laughs> Layla, Summer, Bryce. She's not paying any attention. <laughs> and Blair, Wilson, Bryce. He's not quite sure what's happening. I'm very much reminded this morning, Alan and Amanda, as you bring your lovely family to be baptized into Christ of that story in the Acts of the Apostles where Paul and Silas are in prison and they're singing hymns to God even although they're captive. And then something incredible happens. The gates of the prison cell in which they are are flung open. A miracle. They're set free. And the jailer comes running and he's absolutely frantic because he thinks he's going to lose his job because he's not looked after the prisoners. And he asks about what has happened, and Paul says that this is the work of God, that God has set his people free in an amazing miracle. And the jailer is so convinced that he gets down on his knees and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul takes him through and explains how he should believe in Jesus. And then what happens reminds me very much of what's happening today. The jailer not only comes to faith and is baptized himself, but he brings his whole family to be baptized. What a wonderful thing that must have been. How beautiful. And so you bring your three little ones for their baptism today. Baptism, of course, is always about faith in Jesus Christ. It's not just about sprinkling or making the sign of the cross on a child's or an adult's forehead with some water. This water is no different to any other water that I've been drinking this morning or that you will drink with your lunch when you go home. But it's the sign of what's happening here. Beyond the symbol, Christ is laying claim to all of these little ones and welcoming them into His family. So what we do, we do in obedience to Jesus. We do not make these children or any children automatically a Christian by baptizing them into Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who comes into their hearts as they put their own faith in Him as they grow who does that. By bringing your, child for, your children for baptism, you give expression to your own faith today, promising that what is done here is no empty ritual, but a sign and a seal of God's love for your little ones. I'm going to ask you in a moment to come forward, but as you know, Amanda, I normally try and look up the names of the children that are to be baptized. Well, let me tell you, I had a challenge last week with Mason and Carson, but I've had an even bigger challenge this week. They look like butter wouldn't they melt in their mouths, but I was trying to find out what their names meant. Brody. Brody, you are pretty unique, I think. I couldn't find the meaning of your name, but I do know that it's a good Scottish name. Quite often it's used as somebody's second name rather than as their first name. And you know, I was really struggling to find somebody that was famous that was named Brody. So do you know the thought that came to me, Brody? Maybe you're going to be really famous and make that name famous. What do you think? It means that you are a unique person. You are a one-off, 
And don't we know that? Eh, hey, Amanda? Eh, hey, Alan? He's a one-off, isn't he? And you're going to do something great, we pray, with your life, so that that name can be well known. Layla. Well, Layla apparently is an Arabic name, which means the night. And there were very many beautiful romantic stories written about Layla in the medieval period of history. But Layla is perhaps best known for a song by Derek and the Dominoes. <laughs> One Eric Clapton. You're probably going to burst into song. We hope and pray that Layla Summer, which is her middle name, will have many blessed times in her life. And then we baby Blair. Well, Blair is also a Scottish name. It's usually a surname. It means a field or a plain. So we pray that Blair will be prosperous and fruitful in his life. As for famous people called Blair, I'm not even going there. <laughs> because some people might think I'm trying to influence their politics or their vote for the upcoming election. No more to be said. Anyway, please come up and join me just here at the front because I have one or two questions to ask you as you bring your wee ones for baptism. That's fine, just there. Yeah, just there. You're holding on to daddy, aren't you, Leila? Yeah. Do you earnestly desire that your children may be grafted into Christ as a member of his body, the church? And do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And do you promise, depending upon the grace of God, to teach your children the truths and duties of the Christian faith by prayer and example to bring them up in the life of the church and the worship of the Lord. The Lord bless you as you do the best that you can to parent and God-parent these little ones. Let's share in a prayer, shall we? Father, what a special blessing it is to be here today and to have Brody and Leila and Blair and their parents, Alan and Amanda. Thank you for them. Just bless them as they come for their baptism. I pray for Brody that you will help him always to be that wee unique character that we know he is and that he will trailblaze for that name of Brody. I pray for Leila that you will continue to help her to grow to be a beautiful young woman both inside as well as outside, that she will know Christ. And we pray for Blair, that he will be fruitful, that he will bring a harvest of love, not only to his family, but also to the world, as he comes to know Jesus and shares the message about him with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, um, those of you who are here every Sunday will know that normally at this point we stand just to offer our support to the family bringing their wee ones for baptism. I'm going to ask you to do that in a moment. If you are visiting, then you may be from another church and you're familiar with that as well. Some of you perhaps are not in church very regularly, and that's okay because you're here to see these wee ones baptized this morning. And it's just a pleasure, isn't it? Just a privilege to see a wee family like this coming. So please can I ask you to stand to offer your support to them at this time. Up you come, up you come, all of you. And I'll try and sort out my notes so that I don't get their names wrong, eh? Okay, Brody, we're going to go with you first because you're the oldest. You're the firstborn. Yes, are you going to come over beside me? Yep. Now, I don't take you up into my arms because you're such a big boy, aren't you? Yeah. I'm going to put some water on your head. Is that okay? Yeah. I was hoping you'd say that. Brody. Alan, Bryce, I baptize you in the name of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain in your heart now and always. Amen. And can I just tell you how smart you look in your lovely tie and waistcoat? Now, Leila, you're going to come over beside me with Daddy. You just hold on to Daddy, I think. That might be best. Yeah? You don't need to worry about this. I'm just going to put a wee bit of water on your forehead. I'm not going to mess up your beautiful hair. Layla, 
summer, Bryce, I baptize you in the name of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with your heart now and always. Amen. And what a beautiful dress you've got. You're looking lovely. Will you loan me some of your hair later on? <laughs> Maybe not. Blair, you're going to come and see me for a wee moment? Uh-huh. Oh, he's having a good look at all of you. Yes. Blair Wilson, I baptize you in the name of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest in your heart now and always. Amen. Perfectly well behaved, eh? That's the way. Eh? You're watching Lindsay. Not many weeks. We're going to have a blessing, which is a very ancient blessing from thousands of years ago. Called I'll appear on the screens. The Lord bless you and keep you as we pray God's blessing on Brody, on Layla, and on Blair. Please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. You guys can stay here just for a moment, if you will. According to Christ's commandment, Brody, Alan Bryce, Layla, Summer Bryce, and Blair, Wilson Bryce, are now received into membership of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. They are engaged to confess the faith of Christ crucified and risen, to be his faithful soldier and servant until their life's end. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, I've got a wee gift for all of you. Oh, I've got Brody's attention now. <laughs> as soon as I said a gift, there you go. It's very important that as you grow up, you learn the stories about Jesus. And so, we've got a special book for each of you. Here's one, which has got lots of good pictures in it for you. Okay, Brody? So, if I put that there, I'm going to give that to you to carry. Will you carry that? And then we've got one for Layla as well, which is a little lamb. Look. And it's got the Bible stories in it. So, if I give that to Daddy to hold. And then we've got one for Blair as well, which is a different one. I thought we'd get you all different ones. Didn't want you all to be the same. There you go. And we'll give this to God, Mum. Okay. Now, we're going to sing our final hymn, and as I do, I'm going to bring round the three children to introduce them to you, and so you can give them a wee smile, and so that they feel warmly welcome in Dale St. Andrew's congregation. So, we're going to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. Amanda chose this for us to sing, and it's a fantastic hymn to finish off our service this morning. So, let's sing it together.
May Christ inspire you to be his disciples each and every day. May God the Father bless you for being his people. And may God the Holy Spirit help you faithfully to serve and to love the one triune and living Lord, now and forevermore.